I let um, Antiguous uh, suck me into another one of his sets of points, and uh, and uh, he knows what he's doing. But <laughs> and I thought I wouldn't be talking about this subject again. I don't much want to be esoteric. I think what I have an ability to do, though, is to uh, keep us from being esoteric. In other words, drag it back to the practical. So uh, his points uh, are. I'm going to read this whole thing to you real quickly, and then I'll come back to the points, okay? But um, so, and you'll see it on your screen. So, so nature is beautiful indeed, says Antigius. But then why do a photo and a painting differ? Uh, beauty can be based on what we see as painters, and that's a point, right? And then he's, these are probably sub-points. Uh, the grammar part could use a little bit of work, Antigius. Beauty can be based on what we see as painters, as you describe, and beauty that has to do with making a painting or drawing can be beautiful in itself. A drawing of Degas and Sartre. Now, this is a second point. It's clearly different from the rest. And I'm going to break this out in a second to show you how I'm going to talk about it. But a drawing of Degas and Sartre can be beautiful. It's obvious. If you, if you put these three painters in a room with the same model, they would draw and paint different. Then, that being the case, I think he's saying, beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder as each painter will represent the same model different, one idealized, the other short, and sergeant elongated. Okay, now is that, a, is that clear? All right, let me try to mess with this now. I mean, first of all, let's just start with this first point. Nature is beautiful indeed, but then why do a photo and painting differ, right? Now, that's a long discussion, and I think I'm going to have to do that on a different one. But... I'm going to give you this much. Uh, uh, I'm going to give you more than this much, actually. Let me let me actually move us over. Um, okay, so here's the difference. Here's here's the conversation, right? And I really wasn't. I still won't spend my time there. I won't have any videos to, or visuals to go with this. Uh, but um, but this is the point. We aren't trying to show the viewer the thing we saw but show them what it was that made us want to be there in the first place. Now, understand I'm speaking as an Impressionist. A lot of people, a lot of illustrators, people like that are not are trying to show you something entirely differently. And that's another thing. We're going to make that point later on, not talking about illustrators per se necessarily, but imaginative work. So this is the mystery of Impressionism, the difference between a journalist and a storyteller maybe, right? We're trying to sh not show the viewer the thing we saw, but show them what it was that made us want to be there in the first place. Uh, again, returning to Degas and Stevens, art is nature through the prism of a personality. Now, that's a definition. And it's an unchallenged definition, actually. Remember again Degas saying to the man who had noodled up a photographic likeness, basically it was, yeah, and drawing is not what you see, he says, but what you must make others see. Now, drawing what you see, this meticulous mechanical copying, right? That's not what this is, right? So he says that. Referring to the mindless likeness, what he called losing consciousness before nature, he said, that is just the field. He might have then said, <laughs> that's kind of funny because he's describing a field. He didn't want to see artists out there in that field, right? <laughs> uh, but he might have then said, uh, and are you selling an untouched field? as if it were a well-tended garden. Now, that's the difference between photography and art, isn't it? So, rote copying by an artist, right? Rote copying is a dereliction of duty. Now, this is a big, big, big point, right? An avoidance of personal responsibility. It's not what we're there for. Everybody can see the world. What are we there for? So, at best, what that is is a, is, a, is a preparatory exercise in understanding the visual world itself that a student would put himself through or a master would put a student through, right? So if you're not presuming a mechanical likeness to be the truth, you'd know the difference between common, undiscriminating photography and beauty, the truth of which arises and articulates exactly, shall we say, that which inspired, motivated, motivated you to even pick up the brush. It's a rather indescribable something, the truth of which, the truth of that, <laughs> which, you must, which you must achieve some semblance of or fail as a 
I was, I mean, it says as a painter, but it should say as an artist. Similar to the question of what brought you to the dance in general is the question of what brought you to pick up the brush this time, right? If you proceed without discovering that or finding it along the way, somewhere along the way, uh, your reason to be, you'll fail to express the most significant truth of all. I could stop anywhere along here. Maybe I should. Uh, when you do have that, though, when you do have that, successfully convey that, poor likenesses will not be a result. This is what the big worry is with a lot of people about what I'm talking about in this way of thinking and working. Poor likenesses won't be a result. And, uh, and any, <laughs> any, more, any more than good likenesses will produce that beauty, meaning photographic likenesses. Anyway, that's how you, that, that's the way it is as an impressionist, okay? So just, I just want to make sure that's clear in everybody's mind. And I'll go back to what I was trying to do a minute ago. Okay, so that's the first part. Nature is beautiful indeed, but then why do a photo and a painting differ? Okay, everything to do with you not being there. A photograph is mindless, you know, cameras don't have brains. They don't have souls. They don't have responses, right? I mean, apart from chemical responses, which you can argue humans have as well, <laughs> or involved with humans in indescribable ways, I guess. But let's make his points now. Beauty can be based on what we see as painters, and beauty that has to do with making a painting or drawing can be beautiful in itself. Okay, so you're talking about an impressionist now, in the first case, right? And I'm going to tell you both of these are the same anyway, but in the first case, you're talking about uh, beauty can be based on what we see as painters. Well, it, for an impressionist, it always is, right? And, he, and so he's, we accept that with him. And then he says that beauty ha that has to do with making a painting or drawing can be beautiful in itself. Well, in fact, that's what an impressionist painting is. It's beautiful in itself. It's not beautiful because nature was pretty. It's beautiful because of it's, it's be, because you managed to stay focused on the truth of the beauty that you saw before you, right? Which is the unique. And the difference is that one in one case, there's two different worlds: the imaginative world and the in the impressionist world. People painting from life. You know, I can't argue with Gamma when he broadly tries to say that people painting from life are basically trying to paint the visual impression. That's what they see. It's like they're a typical portrait, that sort of thing, right? And people painting imaginatively, maybe doing an illustration for something like that. And yes, both of them, though, have this need to produce what you might call artificial beauty. Okay. In other words, it's art. It's artifice. It's not nature. And so the beauty of nature is a coincidence. It's a, the beauty of nature is there. You probably wouldn't have painted it if you didn't respond to something about it. But your problem is to have to put it in a rectangle, to draw it forth and put it into a rectangle and actually say this and <laughs> about that, right? In your own words, what was happening in nature in your own words, right? But that doesn't get you to escape. And nobody, in, I know in this group, means to think that way. It doesn't get you out of drawing accurately. In fact, the truth is in the accuracy of the relationships that make up those effects. Anyway, so let me just, now, now I'm just going to, now the rest of this stuff really has to do with um, the final statement here. A drawing of Degas, Ang, Sargent can be beautiful. It's obvious if you put these three painters in a room with the same model, they would draw and paint differently. Then beauty lies in the eye of the beholder as each painter will re represent the same model differently. One idealized, the other short, and Sargent elongated. So he's talking about what would rather be rather a coincidence, right? What I'm going to suggest to you, though, is that all painters paint the truth in front of them. You won't find distorted head sizes. I mean, El Greco is an absolute and complete irregularity in that. It's an, he's an anomaly. Uh, nobody does that. <laughs> I mean, until the modern times, and then he becomes this great icon of, of why distortion is okay. And, you know, the uh, problems with his pictures are all over the place, and some of the beauties of them, much like a, a Van Gogh, some of the beauties of them are very significant. But uh, what I want to show you just now is, I want you just to look at Painters, uh, first of all, Titian. Let's just look at Titian. Oh, I, let me give you this first. I'm sorry. I apologize. So the, he's Tish, so so. Ang says there aren't two arts. There's only one. It's that which has its basis beauty, eternal and natural. By the way, eternal is that is their concept of beauty, and the and, and natural beauty is also there, right? Nature being that from which all perfections emanate and draw their origin. It's in this. It's in nature that one can find this beauty, which is the great object of painting. It's there that one must look for it, nowhere else. 
It's also is impossible for an idea of beauty to be formed apart from nature. And I think that's something very important to keep remembering down here. Uh, and a little bit later, I'm going to show you one where he, where he simply says distortion isn't going to get it, okay? And I'll show you some of that, including El Greco. So, of a beauty superior to that which nature offers, as it is to conceive of a sixth sense, okay? It's, a, it's okay. So, here's Titian. Now, these, these are both imaginative paintings, but what you're seeing here plainly is no evidence whatever of any distortion. The only distortion is perhaps the limits of whether he had models for everything and what, you know, what he had to make up a little bit. And I know that when I work imaginatively, when I do figures imaginatively, I look back some time later, I pull up the thing and how, how the heck did I drew something that far off? How, how did I do that? Well, it's a lack of a model. You didn't use a model. And you didn't, so you didn't use references. So that might very well happen. But in fact, what you see here is everything looks plausible, right? And more than plausible, it looks, looks remarkably accurate. I mean, I think of Titian as actually the... The, the, you know, now, uh, there's something about the conversation of, of da Vinci that makes him the first conversation about Impressionism, but I really, and, and, and the way he works actually, and the way he talks, but, but uh, and I'm talking about, for example, the transitions of light and stuff like that, that he's actually saying, let's look at this and watch this do this down his sleeve, uh, which you can't even see in, in a photograph, you can't see it until you see the paintings in person. But, but here is, uh, here's Titian, and nothing you see in here is anything except the beginning of Impressionism. It's pre-Velasquez Impressionism. I laugh sometimes when I look at this love of Titian. Everybody wants to figure out his glazing methods, but nobody wants to figure out his seeing. It's all in the seeing, guys. It's all in the seeing. It doesn't matter what you do in your methods. What matters is whether you have the relational world well set, whether you know how to play that game, right? Which is why I recommend this idea of the Impressionist straightforward Paint a simple, uh, you know, keep your mediums as simple as you possibly can and paint it just, just like you see it in relation and watch for the dance, watch for the play of, you know, et cetera. But here it is Titian. And I mean, you, you know, these paintings, uh, be, this is, I think, the post-cleaning version of the, uh, of the uh, Titian uh, Rape of Europa. But, but even in this one here, you, you have a, a really significant sense of depth that is rather like what happens to an Impressionist. And both of them you do. I mean, even though this one looks like, the, it almost feels like there's a screen drop behind them or this whole thing cuts out to, as a pattern so it actually forms a flat middle ground, uh, you know, I mean, as if it were almost a patterny plane. Uh, still, th this has all those earmarks of the Impressionist eye, the Impressionist mind. And then you go to Velasquez, and here's Velasquez doing exactly the same thing. I mean, this guy could be the model on your model stand if you have the equipment to, <laughs> to put on his head and all that sort of stuff. Every one of these things, there's no distortion in this work. Now, you'd say, well, yeah, both of these guys you're showing us are Impressionists. Well, that's so, but I'm going to show you other guys. I'll show you Rubens. And it's not like he distorts proportions much except for purpose, but, but the difference is pretty significant. I'll just go there. Uh, because he's making up figures out of his head. Neither of the other two guys is, right? You get that. It's really clear, isn't it? There's nothing about this guy. He does not make stuff up. He's a portrait painter. He paints what he sees. Titian really is the same guy. He's making imaginative work. But these figures, look at that, that, that leg on the Europa. It's, it's like, I mean, it's, it's even got that little bit of, of, of fatty stuff that happens in a middle-aged person sometimes. And uh, it's ridiculous. I mean, like how true it is. The colors are on the face. And it's, it, it strikes you that way in person. And it makes you want to be, as a student, it makes you want to be a better student of the truth in front of you. Well, okay, so those are those guys. We go, to, we go to Rubens, though, and this guy we know is making up figures. I mean, no human being precisely look like this. He's got a formula. Everything he does is based on how to knock off an imaginative picture. So he's like, I think of him as the first comic book artist, in a sense. Now, I don't mean, it's not a put down of any kind. I don't mean that at all. And, it's not, and by the way, I don't think comic book artists ought to be put down. I think that's pretty, it's a pretty astonishing what they do. And it, but what you're what, seeing somebody, though, is he creates his own figure and then makes makes them over and over again like some of these voluptuous figures in some comic book art. And he's just, that's the girl, you know, and that's the guy get model, and that's the this, that, you know, whatever. But, you know, there's a, there's a heavy hand of the Rococo line in there, like with other guys more modern, you'd see the art, art you look in, 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 even in Sargent, you see a little bit of that Art Nouveau mind uh, line. But, 
anyway, but this does not, it, even, but, but, the, but the head sizes look right to the bodies, the arm sizes look right. I mean, so all these things are done without distortion. I mean, without any significant distortion, not with distortion for a purpose that I can see. Uh, yeah. So let's go on. Uh, now, the reason I'm showing you these, this is Degas and Aang. These are the two different worlds, right? And you'd say this is the imaginative world and this is the, um, and this is the, <laughs> this is the beginning of the Impressionist with line world. And what you will see is that these guys draw their proportions the same. They draw their, their shapes well. I mean, scene, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. There's no difference here in these kinds of working. When you get to the figure itself, now I'm showing you an Ang, a, a, a Degas, and a very, very early uh, Degas, where he's a student, and does what any good student would do is just try to understand, you know, get the proportions right, but try to understand how values work, what the shapes of the masses are, how the form turns. I try to understand the science of drawing and the science of seeing, you know, the science of the, of the no, that's seeing in a different way, but the yeah, science of the stuff of the eye, uh, you know, like the shadow line and things like that. Um, when you get to these two over here, these are Rubens again, these three, these are all Rubens again. This is, this is Degas, this is Degas, that's Aang. But what you see over here though is that orientation around his, 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 he, the figure in his head, the preconceived figure in his head, not in the way Aang meant it, but in the sense of this is my, this is my idea of man and I model up people this way and so on. Uh, other painters do it, Michelangelo did it, Millet did it, uh, there's, so there's no damning it or anything like that. But that element of truth, uh, it's still, by the way, the proportions are still, would be right to each other and all those things. But there's that element of distortion that's actually there. But this guy's doing it because he's got a manner going on. He's like Boucher, lumber people. He's got a manner going on. He's got this preconceived ideal that he, everybody is this, right? Every, every person he draws turns into a Rubens uh, person. Well, you see the, the difference is that these guys look like they're the way, if you drew this figure, you'd get the same thing. Now, you wouldn't make the same marks, and that's a point that the guy makes, uh, Antigius makes very nicely. You would not make the same marks. Your education might have been a little different, the kinds of tools you use, so uh, meaning you might be better with the, with the mass than with the point and so on. But nevertheless, in, in, uh, this, this, this really is characteristic of, of a different way of working from that, right? So uh, let's get past that. So I'm showing you these again to show you there's no distortion here. These are, this is Degas, this is uh, Leighton. The drapery studies are great. This is, uh, this is this, these both over here are Leonardo da Vinci. And then these are, are Ang and uh, Sargent. I think these are both Sargents over here. And you can see these people, nobody's doing anything tricky with drapery. Uh, there may be a little bit of stylization going on here, but I'm not so sure how much. But this is a very, uh, shall we say, an early Greek theme, and I, he did he did do stylizations, uh, Ang did. But mostly you can see that these are just plain articulating accurately what looked like the folds as you would expect them to land in a particular kind of material. It happens in Sargent, in Sargent's case, he's doing these things with much more brevity. Well, no, I shouldn't say that. In fact, I show them with a lot of the uh, Angs are very uh, abbreviated. They are nowhere near as worked up as, if, as, as, as that Da Vinci is, which seems to be a study of how to think about light as it relates to, uh, or how to think about light and form and all those things in a scientific way as it relates to a drape. Um, so one more, and this is Bougro over on the left here, and this one too, and this is another Degas. But there really is no essential difference. I, you can see why the appreciation of form is so great. Uh, he's got a, a fair sense of it, but I think the, um, the difference between Bougro and Degas is all the difference in the world from the point of view of the skill with form. Uh, those who can understand, uh, hear me. So now I'm just going to show you portraits. Now here's, here's, here's the um, model, Velasquez. Here's, here's uh, Joseph de Camp, and here's Ang. And then here's Rubens, and none of these guys are distorting their proportions. I mean, nothing looks funny. The eyes are in the right place on the head and all these things. There's no, there's no personality involved in these things at all, in one sense, right? But when you get to Rubens, this is a characterization that's got a piece of his own made-up man. He's, he's the Rubens man. Rubens has self-portrait as, as, as the Rubens Rubens, <laughs> if you follow me. But there's no distortion going on here, no willful distortion going on in any of these things. And uh, and even and that's even true of the even though the, this guy is outline based, more so than than 
than him, you'll get no sense whatever that these guys are distorting anything in terms of light effects or anything like that. And again, with women, and again, this is Rubens, and I'm showing you the distortions he does produce, but the proportions basically are right, the hands to the head and all those sorts of things. Uh, but in places like this, you can see that this is not a hand. It doesn't feel like a seen hand, does it? And the face actually has what I'd call distortions. Uh, it doesn't feel true. These two feel simply true, even though they're wildly different in the way they were approached. So, so, so the question is, if all these guys went into the room and were drawing together, would they come out with elongated figures? And the answer is not, except because they missed. I mean, Sargent talks famously about missing from time to time. So let's talk about that whole distortion idea. So Sargent has, the, I, I pulled up these three because they were very long looking pictures. And this, these two are clearly within the realm of, of the seven head sort of world. This one here is definitely at least eight, if not more than that. And I've seen women at eight heads, but I think eight heads is probably lands about here with this model. And that doesn't seem likely because this dress looks like it's dropping straight down from her waist to here, which puts the foot out here somewhere. So she might even be more than that. But Sargent talks about having difficulties. He doesn't say he's doing it to be expressive. He talks about the difficulties he has with head sizes. And yes, but, he, but at the end of the day, that's not what happens when you go into a room and you're just painting and you're painting what you see, right? That's not, that's not the distortion you expect. It's not, and it's not routine with him at all. He's a, he's a very articulate, very accurate uh, proportion guy for the most part. So Ang here talks about it. He says, they didn't correct their models, the ancients. I mean, by that, they didn't distort them. If you translate sincerely what's there, you'll proceed as they did. And he's talking about what's there in front of you on the model. You will proceed as they did. And like them, you'll arrive at the beautiful. Isn't that interesting? So paint straight and true like a Christian, the, the, the sort of the decamp conversation. If you follow another course, if you claim to be, to, to correct what you see, you'll only arrive at the false, the ambiguous or the ridiculous. And that's a big deal, but I mean, there are days in which Dick Ang himself looks ridiculous, right? And now, if you look at any of his stuff, much of his stuff, you'll see that, especially in drawings. And, but you know what he's doing. He's trying to do an ideal of some period. And so, yeah, in that effort, it doesn't surprise you that from time to time you look ridiculous. But, not, but he's talking about this, this whole thing, proceed as the ancients did. So you're talking about Phidias. That was one of his favorite guys. Talk, look at Phidias. And he does talk about the guy using the best parts of a model and stuff, but he doesn't talk about a guy distorting proportions and things. So you can think about that. You can think that through. So here's, here is possibly the most distorted, apart from Salvador Dali or somebody, most distorted, uh, the, the painter who does the most distorting in history. This is El Greco. But it does not have completely that element of the ridiculous in it. Nobody's going to go into a room to draw the model and wind up with a model that looks like these guys. And I'm going to suggest to you again that he's making these figures, the whole painting up out of his head, probably. He may, I, I, yeah, you can usually tell, and this has enough marks of being, nature having been involved in it, but it's, it's hard to say. So some people have taken the view that El Greco just had eye problems, you know, that he had an astigmatism or something. If you're painting from life, the astigmatism will, you might say that you would have to do, if you see a thing distorted here, you have to make it distorted here for it to look like that. And I think that would be self-correcting myself, but that's just me. Um, now, in our times, uh, I'm sorry, in the, in the uh, Art Deco era, here's this person, Lempica, who I've always, I've always been rather a fan of this. I mean, some of you guys might be shocked by me, but <laughs> uh, Art Deco amuses me. And if you haven't seen a movie called uh, Sky Captain, The World of Tomorrow, you might go look at it for a feeling for Art Deco. A nice, a fun romance thing from sort of a Flash Gordon variety. But this is Lempica, and, uh, and you can see that every mark she makes is, is out of a, if you want to call it a formula, a style formula book. You know, she's probably written her little style formula book in her head, at least, if nowhere else. <laughs> And so every time she does a fold, every time she does a form, there's this style formula element to it. So that's, that's, but that's not, and yet you're still seeing that basically the proportions are right. People aren't doing funny distortions. So we get back to these guys. Here you have, here you have again a Rubens on the, on the bottom right. And you can see again, even though that figure looks, every part of these figures looks proportionally pretty true in the Rubens, you can see that he has this propensity to go make Ruben's legs, for example, and a Ruben's figure, and a Ruben's face. Well, that is very different indeed, yeah. And so if you walk into the room with your ideas, yeah, when you look at the model, you're gonna, you're gonna be working from a different framework. You're gonna be saying, okay, 
I already have this thing I do. It's my safe zone. So I'm going to draw the figure. And but then you start applying all your stuff and all your junk to it. What impressionism does for you, especially if you're a, a, a student, what it does for you is it keeps your eye, your brain clear of, of, of formulaic stuff. Doesn't mean you couldn't at some time create one for yourself, you know, create a formulaic figure. And and uh, I'm not a fan of uh, I, I self create figures all the time, but I'm not a fan of the distortion. So I don't do this to it when I make them. I try to make them out of my head, even as like as I can and like they belong together, but also that they are like nature, but it's still a formulaic figure. I've showed you some of those in the past. But you can see the, the, in the case of, though, of um, the difference in the case of Titian, where this guy is just simply feels like the naive eye. This feels like truth with its limits, but it's not the limits of, of having manufactured something or come into the room with some preconceived thing. He's really very close to being the naive eye. So I think that's where we leave this. Oh, no, I can actually show you more. Baudry's got the, uh, the opera in Paris if you want to go look at something. But this is a case where you really see severe distortion, right? This is a little dinky head. Uh, and I'm not even clear why that would have been a necessity for him. But in, in, and, and, and by the way, I really like the work of Baudry. Um, but uh, so his, everything has a stylization. It's very much like Boucher. I could have showed you Boucher and a whole bunch of other guys. But everything about this guy has a preconceived idea of some sort about it, right? It's, and, and if you look at his drawings, they actually feel like they are from his little own book of how to paint the figure, how to draw the figure. That's not in the same class of what we're talking about. So here's the final statement. I just You can read this on your own if you like, but I want you to see it. Uh, I'll read it to you anyway, and you can cut me off any time. <laughs> in Painting from Life, we don't assume a mechanical likeness to be the truth the, the artist is pursuing. The difference between common, undiscriminating photography and beauty is huge. Okay, the truth you aim at articulating is that which inspired and motivated you to pick up the brush in the first place. So you know where I am. This is very much where I started. I'm going to just leave you with this so you have a photo shot of it, okay? All right, and that's probably enough time for today on a subject that I thought I would never pick up again, but it does matter. This is one of the huge things that goes on in painting. Uh, come back to this one singular point that everybody, when you're making a picture, you're in a different place from a guy who's just painting a slice of life. When you, once you get into that rectangle, you're in a different zone. Art is not nature, right? Any more than a field is a garden. So think it through for yourself and uh, see how it affects what you do and how you think. And why, in my case, I'm trying to tell you to become a really good impressionist before you start deciding what else you want to be. Okay? That's how profound the truth is that you want to be invested in. Get yourself deeply, deeply saturated with the capacity to see the truth, express the truth in front of you. And I'm talking about now in that, if you want to call it mindless, naive way. And as you go along, you'll find that you have far greater powers than people who haven't done that. Okay, my experience. Thank you very much. Uh, my golly, you know, it's the huge spike in viewing last week. And I really appreciated that. Uh, you people sharing, a bunch more of you sharing lately, and I do it like that, thank you. And, um, and we're over, well over a thousand subscribers now. So. Stay tuned. I'll try to keep you happy. Uh, hopefully, any of these questions pertaining to this one, get, let me know if there's something point I'm making that just is off a little bit, because I'm happy to concede if there's a point like that, uh, or if there's other fresh things. But uh, and, and by the way, get some other overwhelming questions in here so Antiguous doesn't own me, <laughs> or us. <laughs> okay. Hey, I like you, Antiguous. Thank you very much. All right. See you next time.